So we uh, continue in our series on in the book of Exodus today and uh, we come to the third of our talks on the ten words which God gave to Israel and through them to the whole world and uh, as the Bible readings have indicated what we're looking at in particular this morning is the last section of those ten words those words which relate to what we might call direct human relationships. In fact, there probably are no direct human relationships. The only relationships we have with one another in the body of Christ is through Christ. And then conversely, the only relationships we have with one another outside of Christ are through the flesh. And uh, that's not a very pretty place to be. But uh, in what we'll be talking about today... Uh, we find these things very simply. Firstly, that to love God is to love our neighbour. As the translation was read for us, our fellow man, but our neighbour in the old sense of the word. To love God is to love our neighbour and no one can say that he loves God if he hates his neighbour, even if that neighbour is your wife or your husband or your son or your daughter or your grandfather or your grandmother. And so the Apostle John says that we cannot say that we love God whom we have not seen if we hate our neighbour who we have seen. So to love God is to love our neighbour. But the truth is, of course, that we've neither loved God nor loved our neighbour. And in a most undeserved and inexpressible and glorious exchange. God in Christ becomes our neighbour. And as our neighbour, we just demonstrate that we've never loved God nor nor our neighbour and we crucify the Son of God. And we crucify the Son of God because we hate the one who sent him. Jesus was very plain about that. It was not just that we didn't like him personally. It was not, as they say in the modern terminology, personality issue, personality conflict. We hated Christ because we hated the Father. So in crucifying the Son, we've demonstrated to ourselves and to the whole universe that we've never loved God. And then most remarkably in this undeserved and inexpressible exchange, Christ shows that he's been a neighbour to us when we were never neighbour to him. And while we hated him, he reviled not in return and he uttered no threats but kept commending himself to God and he entrusted himself who was the faithful creator, trusted himself to God who was the faithful creator and indeed so great was his love for his father that even as we were crucifying him, he was praying for us. So if you know that, what else do you need to know? But to know that is life. Not to know that is to condemn us to relate to one another out of the flesh. And where we relate to one another out of the flesh, where we do not meet one another at the cross, where we do not stand forgiven at the cross, then out of the flesh all we will know will be distension, strife, bitterness, faction and all of the dreadful things that flow from that place called the flesh. And as we said last time and as we will reiterate just a little this morning, it comes as something as a surprise to us, if not a shock to us, to realise that in that acting action of saving us, Christ has done nothing except obey the law. He never had to transgress the commandment to save us. Indeed, to save us, he couldn't transgress the commandment. And if the Lord gives us to hear perhaps today, we may understand how different that is from the way we think we have to go about things. 
So let's turn then to these commandments and as we've said we're not doing each of these commandments in detail. That would be another job for another time because we're going through Exodus but we have spent a lot of time in the midweek groups doing each of these commandments in detail. For those who've been in those groups some of this will be revision. The commandment immediately following the Sabbath which we remember was we said was a way in which we demonstrated our honour for God our Father. Uh, We honoured him by not taking his name in vain or we honoured him positively by singing praise to his name, rejoicing in his name, adoring his name, praising his name, blessing his name. So we honour him by not taking his name in vain. We honour him by entering into the rest which he's commanded us. What other God would grant to his people a rest? What other God would command us to be joyful? It's astounding, isn't it? But we enter into that resting place typified by the Sabbath and so we, we honour God by being at rest in his presence. And then in verse 12 of Exodus 20, we move from the direct honouring of God to the indirect honouring of God through honouring our parents. It may be seen perhaps on the surface to say that honouring fathers and mothers moves completely from the divine realm to the human realm but in fact uh, verse 12 acts as a hinge between the first set of commandments which have to do with direct honour for God and the last set of commandments which have to do with the way in we express that honour and love for God in our human relationships. So the way we relate to our parents and the way we honour our parents is a direct reflection and expression of the way we honour God. It is a very particular example of that principle that we just expounded in the introduction that no one can say he hates God Uh, No one can say he loves God if he hates his brother. And I would suggest that many of our angers and hatreds and hostilities and bitternesses and unforgiveness issues in the world relate to our parents and in particular to our fathers and even more if we say, well, I never knew my father, so how can I be angry with him? Well, you may be more angry with him than you ever realised. Now behind this commandment stands something which I take as an assumption throughout the Old and New Testaments and that assumption is this, that there is only one true Father. The Bible does not allow us to think about God in terms of comparison or an analogy. It only allows us to think about God in terms of reality or the word that we've used here before, ontology, the way things really are within God's own being. And there is only one true Father. That is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, just as there's only one true Son and one true Spirit. And so our understanding of fatherhood and here it's broader than just fatherhood because it is honour your parents, male and female, but both male and female constitute the image of God, surely. And so to honour our parents is a direct expression of the way that we honour God as our father. In other words, we do not work, as you've often heard it said from here, we do not work from the ground upwards but from heaven downwards. So if we're thinking honour your father and our fathers are just a version of God written small or God is a version of our fathers written large, we've got the thing back to front. God the heavenly father is not like our earthly fathers, thanks be to God. But our earthly parents, because it is a commandment for parents, reflect something of who God is. So even the worst of parents, you being evil, know how to give good gifts. Now it may be that what some of our evil parents designate as good gifts are not really good 
But in fact, they think that in giving those gifts, they are doing good. We recognise in our earthly parents for the first time as we come into the world that there is a universe in which there is authority and sovereignty. We have in recent days been blessed with an abundance in the creche. They are a joy to us, are they not? But you ask any of the young mums and dads around the congregation, when that child is born, are they a pliable, acquiescent, settled, peaceful little spirit within their breast? And the answer is no. As we said, they come out fighting, don't they? And they come out as a complete individual and at the best we may be able to do a little bit of tweaking around the edge but the son or the daughter that you're born with is the son or the daughter that you're going to have when they are 97. (coughs) Like those of us who have been blessed with more than one child can say that Henry... Uh, We've got a Henry here. I'm trying to think of a name we don't have. You know, Aloysius. (laughs) Aloysius was Aloysius from the day that he appeared on the scene, wasn't he? And you try and apply the rules to Aloysius' little brother, they don't work. So we find right from the very, very beginning that as a child comes into the world, it meets authority on its own terms, head on. And it meets the sovereignty that parents exercise over it on its own terms. And the way in which it relates to that authority in some sense tells us about the way in which it relates to God because our parents give us the first impressions of God because they are the ones who first rule over us and they are the ones who first have sovereignty. Now there's much more we could say about this but we could say simply this that this commandment honouring our fathers and mothers does not give us the luxury of evaluating the worthiness of our fathers and mothers. That's a sneaky trick. If my dad were a better dad I would have been a better son. Not true. You would have been the same son. You just would have been rebellious in a different way if your dad had been different. Let no one say, says Ezekiel, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. The son's sins are the responsibility of the son, not the father. You cannot hold a father accountable for his son's sins, neither can you hold a son accountable for his father's sins. That's what Ezekiel 18 is all about. But as that child comes into the world and as it meets that authority and that sovereignty and as it meets that first representation of God that it has, then we discover how reluctant we are to live under any authority ourselves. And we say that our problems with authority and our problems with our parents' authority in particular are because of the failures of their parenting. But as we said, this commandment does not actually give us the luxury of sitting back and saying, well, if they're worthy of my honour, I will honour them. What a proud thing that is to say. You are to honour them simply because they're your parents. And there's something about the way in which you honour them by virtue of just being your parents that says this is the way I honour God by virtue of him just being God. God doesn't give me the luxury of saying, well, if you like my reign and rule over you, then you can submit to it, but if my reign and rule is displeasing to you, then you're off the hook, you don't have to submit to it. If that were the case, none of us would ever submit to his reign and rule because none of us love him. So what does it mean for us to honour our father and mother? And the answer is it's to do good for them. 
It's to look out for their welfare, it's to bless them, it's to love them, it's to serve them. Now, the shape of that varies from age to age and stage to stage. It is very appropriate for a two or three year old when mum or dad ask him to put his toys back in the box at the end of the evening before bed. It is very appropriate for that little tot to say, yes, mum and dad, in spirit, I will do that immediately. You just try and get it to happen. But if you've got a 40-year-old living at home and he's still not doing anything unless he gets mum and dad's approval to do it, there's something you think that's a little bit strange. So the honouring varies from age to age and stage to stage because at a certain point there is an authority and sovereignty that our parents have over us in order to shape us, to fit us for society. But there is another stage where we come to, coming through our teenage years, and I would say particularly as we come to that stage where we have some financial independence, we honour our parents not in that you know, baby, toddler sense of being subject to their every word, but by honouring the things that they honour, by loving the things that they love, and by not bringing shame to them because you love them. And then when you, should you be granted the gift of marriage and you leave and you cleave, then you, then you honour them in a different way. Because if you are to honour them in a marriage where you've left and you've cleft and you've joined to your wife or your husband and you are now one flesh, it's not easy then if you keep running back to your mum and dad and saying, what should I do? In fact, it's very wrong and destructive if that happens, isn't it? Hence all the mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> and then there's another stage of life where as a mature person, you honour your parents by providing for them when they cannot provide for you. Like in their old age, you do for them that which they did for you in your young age. And so part of the reason that the Lord grants to us vocations by which we get income is that we may set some of that income aside to care for our parents and that we may look to be in a position where, may, where their needs are met. Now that not, may not mean that we have to do all of that. Like if they need heart treatment in a hospital, you don't keep them in the front lounge room who actually attend to what's needed, but that is an honouring of your parents. And if your parents are very aged and impoverished and you have three home units and a holiday house at the beach and you say, sorry, Mum and Dad, I haven't got a spare penny to put you away, how dwells the love of God in you, may I ask? So the honouring of the parents is not as long as they live but as long as you live because you could meet a person whose parents are long gone and in your own heart you're still dishonouring them. Or you can meet a person whose parents are long gone and in your own heart you're still honouring them. You're honouring their memory, you're not bringing shame upon their memory, you're doing that which bears all things, believes all hope things and hopes all things even though they have passed away. And that way in which we honour our parents through our lives links with the rest of the commandments that then follow. Murder, adultery, stealing, false witness and coveting. Because we will find in that relationship with our parents if there dwells in us a continued selfish, self-centred and greedy attitude, then that will work out in all of our relationships. But you will find also that if in your heart towards your parents the Lord's given you a liberty of love and generosity towards them, you will find surprisingly perhaps that that is worked out in all manner of relationships positively also. 
So this commandment, verse 12, hangs as, not hangs as, but is a hinge on which the two tablets of the law turn. That our love towards God is reflected in the way we honour our parents and the way we honour our parents flows through into the way that we love our neighbour as ourselves. The rest of the commandments tell us that we honour and love our neighbour by not depriving them of things which rightly are theirs. Firstly, you shall not deprive them of the life that is their life. You shall not murder them. And you shall not deprive them of the marital relationship which is theirs. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not deprive them of the property which the Lord has granted to their hands, so thou shalt not steal. You shall not deprive them of a defence in court which may, in the Old Testament, allow them to be put to death or stoned. You shall not deprive them of their liberty by bearing false witness against them in court. Now, each of these commandments, as we've said in the... uh, groups on Tuesday and Wednesday evening, each of these commandments stand as the, at the head of, or all the commandments in fact, but each of these in particular, stand at the head of what we might call a family of like commands. So we may tease out thou shalt not steal into categories such as fraud or embezzlement or theft but there's a whole family of commands that are ruled over by thou shalt not steal. Just as there's a whole family that are ruled over by thou shalt not murder and a whole family that are ruled over by thou shalt not bear false witness, which in the original setting is probably speaking about what happens in the... uh, uh, setting of Israel where they had to... uh, they had circuit judges later going through and uh, the rules about how they bore witness in that were very uh, very strict and detailed and therefore they were not to bear false witness that could injure someone by getting them convicted of some transgression against the law which may end up with them being put to death or whatever. But in a smaller sense, gossip is false witness and just as destructive. Now these great commandments all have, as we've said, an ontological foundation. That is, they have a foundation which is in the life of God. So that we could go through all of the commandments and say, in God there is no false witness. He never can and never does bear false witness to himself. So therefore thou shalt not bear false witness. In God... There is no theft. The Father does not steal the things that belong to the Son nor the Spirit steal the things that belong to the Father but rather contrary-wise there is a complete self-giving that the Father gives all that he has to the Son. In the Godhead there is no sense at all of covetous desire, deadly intent, murder. There is positively love, joy, peace, the constant giving of one to the other, the constant exalting of one to the other, the constant praising and thanksgiving, the constant honouring. There is no sense in which any of the commandments can be broken by God because the commandments are the way God is. As we said, they have an ontological foundation and they have a creational expression in that the way we have been being made in his image is to match those. So you meet a person who walks at liberty and you'll meet a person who does what this says. This is the law of liberty. This is the law of love. And so they have a sinful perversion and we know all about that only too well, don't we? We know how little we've honoured our parents. We know how much we've thieved and stolen over the years. We know how much murder we've had in our heart towards one another. And Christ comes and he fulfills them all, as we'll see 
in a moment. But then, as we've said, there is this eschatological goal for each of the commandments. What will there be in the end when there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new community created out of that great action of the cross? There's going to be a command over us all under which we live in the liberty and there will be no thieving, no coveting, no false witness, no murderous intent, no idolatry, only love of God and only love of an abbot. That is the new heavens and a new earth. So if we are rebelling against the creation or if we're rebelling against the commandments, we're rebelling against the creation. If we're saying these commandments are not what I want, then we're saying the new heaven and the new earth are not what I want. If these commandments are too burdensome for us, then I do not want to be conformed to the image of the Son of God who has kept these commandments and whose desire is that we will be brought into the fullness of them. But these commandments, as we said, stand at the head of a whole family, each one, and that family goes right down not simply to the deeds but to the desires. And the last of the commandments pinpoints that very powerfully for us. Thou shalt not covet. Now in the Old Testament occasionally the word covet can be used almost synonymously with the word theft so it does relate to action, actually taking something. But as we read in Deuteronomy verse five, uh, chapter 5 verse 21, to covet is to desire. There's one Hebrew word used for covet and another used for desire and they're held in parallel and that's given even more force when we think back to the creation story and the fall in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 and the woman saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to the eyes and to be desired to make one wise and it's the same word as covet here every sin comes from an inordinate desire if you were listening to the Bible readings from Romans and Galatians this morning you will have picked up where it's speaking about the deeds of the flesh and those things they are linked with desire now desire may not be wrong. That word desire can also be used in a positive way about desiring your law and desiring your presence and desiring your wife rather than desiring the one who is not your wife in Proverbs, for example. But here desire is inordinate in the sense that it wants to seek and to grasp and to take to itself Now, we understand, do we not? I mean, we're not talking theory here this morning, folks. We understand, do we not, that when that desire gets its roots and hooks into your heart, you will go for that thing that your desire has set no matter what. The providences of God, you'll overrule them in your actions the teaching of God you'll overrule in your conscience manipulations, the commands of God you'll overrule because in this case particularly they don't, com- they don't apply to you because it's such a special case. And you, even if hell itself be attached to that thing, you will not be dissuaded from it. The, the power of the covetous desire is untellable and it's that power of covetous desire which gives all of these commandments their hold and it goes all the way back to that account in the garden desirable to make one wise and in brackets we could put desirable to make one wise in my own eyes. So I, thank you God, know what's good for me. 
I don't need to honour you as my heavenly father because you don't really know what I need, God. I know what's best for me and I'm going to pursue it. Come hell or high water, I will pursue it. Because desirable to be make, make one wise, in brackets, in my own eyes, because I will have my own knowledge of good and evil and you, God, will not be able to persuade me otherwise. And I will end up calling evil good and good evil and I'll end up calling darkness light and light darkness so much so that when the light of the world comes into the world we accuse him of being an agent of darkness. And behind all of that, desirable to make one wise in my own eyes with my own knowledge of good and evil because the day that I eat I will be as God. So who needs God when you're your own God? And who would honour God when you're your own God? And who would love God when you're your own God? And who would think his commandments joyful when your own commandments are all that you're interested in? And who would think that his ways are perfect when you already know what's good and God's the one who has to catch up? And Paul, the great righteous man, was undone by this commandment. He could tick all the boxes. He'd never worshipped an idol. He'd never bowed down to a graven image. He'd never murdered. He'd never slept with anyone else's wife. But then, the commandment, thou shalt not covet, hid him between the eyes, he says. And it produced in me coveting of every kind because he could see that his whole life was covetous and most specifically and most terribly it was covetousness of a righteousness of God which came by his own works of the law not by that which was granted through faith in Christ. So who doesn't need a saviour this morning? hands up the man or woman who thinks they can stand in the face of God's judgement and say, well, actually, I'm not all that bad. We're undone, aren't we, by these things? And if the Lord God were to call us into his chamber this morning as the great judge of all the earth and say, well, what do you have to say for yourself? We'd have to say, Your Honour, my life is indefensible because my heart is indefensible. And God was a neighbour to us when we neither loved him or cared for him or honoured him or served him. He sent his son and his son was a neighbour to us. Now, we live in a world of superheroes and action heroes <laughs> and it struck me as I've been thinking about this over the last couple of weeks that all of our superheroes and our action heroes have got a dark edge to them. Like Wolverine's a good guy but would you really want him to have to be in your lounge room? You know? The X-Men have always got something that they can call on which is super normal and most of it's got a pretty dicey edge to it. I don't know how many of us here would have read a James Bond novel or seen a James Bond film, I won't ask you. But James Bond we love because you know he can knock off the good guys but he doesn't have to be morally correct. Like thou shalt not commit adultery is probably not on James Bond list of commandments. So we find it almost incredible that someone could be a hero to us, so to speak, and not be dark, not somewhere play with the law, not somewhere be on the edge of things, not somewhere transgress 
for the greater good. And it comes to us as a surprise and I dare say if you think about it, it comes to you as a deep shock that Jesus had no rebellion in his heart at all. And all he did was to do exactly which the law says. So he had no covetousness in his heart. He regards equality with God, not a thing to be grasped, but empties himself, taking the form of a servant, being found in the likeness of men. He humbles himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Not very James Bondish. And in his heart, he never bore false witness, nor did he have a murderous thought or intention because as he describes in Matthew chapter 5, the issue with the commandments is not just the action but the intention. You and I might not have physically murdered a person but we've machine gunned them in our brains a hundred times. Our political processes are just polite machine guns. Our legal mindset is really just a polite machine gun. We can't machine gun our neighbour but we'll take him to court. Who of us here has not committed the sin of adultery if we understand what Jesus meant about lust? Inordinate desire. And to have this man who is the most true, full, complete human being who lived at liberty and none of it was ever in his heart. When reviling, when being reviled rather, he didn't have an angry murderous retort. When being accused, he accused not in return. When all he did throughout his life was to love the Lord his God with all his heart and mind and strength and to love us who had never loved him. And in that, not to decide whether he was going to honour his father by doing his will or not and not weighing up whether God's will was good but only saying, not my will but thine be done, Father. And so as a man in utter submission and utter conformity to the will of his father on both sides of the commandments, those towards God and those towards man, is a man born of woman, born under the law, and he redeemed those who are under the law. Because our being under the law was different. Our being under the law was under the curse of the law, under the guilt of the broken law, under the shame and the transgression of the law. Our being under the law was under the condemnation of the law, and under that condemnation we were not neighbour to him, but he was neighbour to us. And under that condemnation of the law, we loved not his father, but he loved his father for us. To bring us to a place where incredibly and most wonderfully, you and I might be here this morning and say, Abba, Father, I love you. That transformation is the most astounding miracle that a human being could ever know. It's the same as being raised from death to life. We were dead in our transgressions and our sins. And any of us could, stay, could stand here this morning and actually love God. What has our elder brother done for us that that could be the case? What has he done for us then? Out of that love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts, he could cause us to love one another. And to love one another, beloved, with a love which doesn't desire wrongly. To love one another with a love which doesn't desire to possess. To love one another with a love where your greatest ache is that you cannot give. The Apostle Paul says, Beloved, that's where you are. 
That's the place you've actually been brought to in Christ and it's that freedom for which Christ has set you free. So walk at liberty in the liberty of love. Do not turn that liberty and an opportunity for the flesh, he says, but through love serve one another. The question is not what you can get from your neighbour. The question is how can I serve you? How can I love you? Not because you have got it within yourself but because God has loved you when you didn't love him. And he sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. Beloved, that is true liberty, that's true Christian maturity, that's, if I could put it this way, the normal Christian life. So, beloved, let us walk in love as he has loved us, not counting one another's transgressions against one another, not holding on to the unforgiveness when he has forgiven us.